Good morning. I think we'll get started. Thank you so much for being here on this very cold morning. Winter has certainly arrived in Iowa. Um, I wanted to welcome you to the symposium that accompanies the current exhibition at the Anderson Gallery um, entitled uh, Building a Modern Campus, Ileal and Aero Saarinen at Drake University. And the show traces the contributions of the world famous architects Ileal and Aero Saarinen at Drake. Um, as those of you who were at the opening last night know, in the years after World War II, um, to accommodate expanding enrollments, Drake hired this father and son team to design a master plan for the university. Um, they also executed nine new buildings and expanded an existing dormitory. And if you haven't yet seen the show, the gallery will be open um, this afternoon from 12 to 4. Um, you're welcome to, to stop over there. And then the gallery is open uh, during the week, Tuesday to Sunday, noon to 4. So we invite you to, to come to the gallery. Um, also, I wanted to mention this part of the exhibition programming. We um, have prepared a self-guided tour of the Saarinen buildings on campus, um, and there are copies of that uh, in the back of the room. There's also a website featuring video tours of the Saarinen buildings, um, and that's at www.buildingamoderncampus.com, and it will be a permanent link um, from the Coles Library website. Um, I realized I didn't say my name at the beginning. I'm Maura Lyons. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Art and Design at Drake University. Um, I'm the curator of the exhibition um, with much assistance from uh, three classes at Drake who worked on the show. I wanted to thank the sponsors of the exhibition, AIA Iowa, Humanities Iowa and the National Endowment for the Humanities, and Drake University. Um, and we are set, circulating a sign-up sheet um, from Humanities Iowa. Um, we would be grateful if you would sign in. And with your program, you received an evaluation form that um, will help us to improve our public programming. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out, there is a space in the back of the room um, to leave those with us. I want to just briefly walk you through the program from this morning. I'm very excited um, that um, the speakers uh, who are here have agreed to participate. I'm very much looking forward to their talks. Um, we'll begin with the keynote address um, and then with some time for questions after that talk. Then there'll be a short break. Um, you can go down and get another cup of coffee if you'd like. Um, and then I will introduce the next three speakers. Uh, after their talks, I want to open up the conversation with you. Um, and we'll have the panel come and sit in the front and um, have a, you know, a question and answer period. So I wanted to begin by introducing the keynote speaker, um, Professor Peter Papadimitriou, very graciously uh, agreed to be, participate in the program today. And he is a professor and graduate program director for the School of Architecture at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And I am going to excerpt from his very extensive CV and just tell you some of uh, the highlights of that. Um, he has produced a book on Louis Kahn, An Architectural Guide to Houston. Um, he served as the executive editor of the Journal of Architectural Education and acts as a frequent contributor to architectural journals, including his longtime role as a correspondent for progressive architecture. Uh, he's curated a number of architectural exhibitions, including a show on Alvar Alto. And he's a recipient um, of awards, uh, including uh, grants from the Graham Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, relevant specifically for today's program, he is a recognized expert on Ileal and Aero Saarinen and has published and lectured extensively on both men. He's currently working on a book um, on Aero Saarinen. And from the conversations I've had with him and the brief preview I had of the talk this morning, um, I know that this book will offer many new insights into this important architect. His, uh, the title of his presentation this morning is Saarinen versus Saarinen, The Search for an American Modern Architecture. Um, please join me in welcoming Peter Papadimitriou. I was actually looking at Wired Magazine in the library yesterday, <laughs> so I feel at home. Let me um, cut a few of these lights so that, uh, whoops, wrong way. Okay. 
For those of you that have seen the exhibit, um, there'll probably be a couple of repeat slides, and I, I begin with this image of the father and son, um, which is the first image that you'll see in the exhibition if you haven't already seen it. <clears throat> I'd like to take a few minutes to express my thanks for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure to come back to Des Moines. I've been here about six times, I guess, since the 80s. Um, last time I was here was at the 50th anniversary of the Des Moines Arts Center, in which I participated with a number of other people associated with the uh, production of that building. Um, I'd also like to thank Mar Mara for in inviting me. It's uh, really a great pleasure. And having read her catalog essay on the theme of the exhibition, I'd say it's, it's so excellent that I feel, in a way, it's kind of a hard act to follow at this point. I entitled my remarks, Sarenin versus Sarenin, to uh, discuss the position of what I consider to be in the underrated Des Moines years, <coughs> if you will, in the professional uh, work of the Sarenins and the development of modern architecture in America. Firstly, permit me to review a few dictionary definitions. Duad, noun, a unit of two objects, a pair. Duo, two persons commonly associated with each other. Dual, adjective, compared, comp comprised of two usually like complementary parts. Dualism, noun, the condition of being double. Duality, noun, the quality or character of being twofold. And further, dichotomy, division into two usually contradictory parts or opinions. Botany, branching characterized by successive forking into two approximately equal divisions. Eliosarinen and Eriosarinen shared the exact same date of birth, August 20th, 1873 and 1910. They both had the same initials. They both had international recognition in the same career as architects. They both married twice. They both had a son and daughter, and they were and are very likely to remain the only father-son duo who were both recipients of the gold medal of the American Institute of Architects. Elio Siren and father began a second career in architecture when he, he immigrated to America in 1923 at age 50. Ero Saarinen ended an emerging career in 1961, just after his 50th year, when he died of an undetected brain tumor. Elio and Eros Saarinen reflect not only these dualities, but also ultimately a dichotomy of what we might call style, whose commonalities and divergences manifest the transition within the so-called modern movement in America. What then do the Des Moines years <coughs> fit into this critical history of American modernism? The two projects of the Edmondson uh, Art, Mu Art Museum, the Des Moines Art Center, and the decision by President uh, Harmon of Drake University to undertake a master plan and finally, as uh, Mora mentioned, nine building projects following the Second World War represents a, di a, a didactic beginning, <coughs> a conscious bringing of modernism as a fitting representation of institutions dedicated to public education and cultural awareness. In terms of the Des Moines years, impact on the architectural careers of the Saarinans, it marks both an end and a beginning. The period of the Des Moines Arts Center's inception through construction 1941 through 1948, and the period of Drake University's master plan and building program 1946 to 1958 comp comprise a critical time in which the young acorn of Eero Saarinen began to emerge from the shadow of the great oak tree of Eliel Saarinen it was a period in which modernism in America itself began to come of age. The younger Saarinen grew up in Finland, near Helsinki. That's the little cutie in the flower dress. <laughs> in the secluded retreat of Vitresk, the home studio built by Eliel with his partners Gesellius and Lindgren, starting in 1902, but occupied completely by the Saarinens after 1916. Edo was virtually illiterate in Finnish, as his family was primarily Swedish speaking. This somewhat aristocratic background placed the family into a more international sphere. The home overlooked the great white lake. There are the two boys together, father and son. Father's on the right. Um, <laughs> which was a center of creative energy. And Elio Saren entertained some of Finland's intellectuals and artists as well as maintain um, a studio <coughs> that continued to produce ideas of architecture and planning. That's Eero right here, Daddy's right there. 
when he had become a prominent architect in his native Finland, the um, severe economic crisis following the end of World War I with independence from Russia um, prompted Eliel at age 49 to enter an international competition uh, for headquarters of the Chicago Tribune building in 1922 with hopes of winning a major commission. His tapering silhouette design defined the tall building, an American invention to Americans, awarded second prize mainly because the boards arrived late for judging, but the jury decided to give him second prize in any event. It enhanced his international reputation. With the substantial prize money, Aliel came to America in early, early 1923, followed by the family in uh, the middle of the year <coughs> who arrived in Chicago. The year was an important point for Arrow also because at age 12, he had won a competition for a story with the Sweden's largest newspaper, Dagens Nyheter, which otherwise is known as the Daily News, with an illustrated tale of three, let's see if you can see it, three characters on the right-hand column, three matchstick characters, a kind of love triangle, which since they were matchsticks, you can imagine what happened. It was, didn't end well, as you can see by the crosses on the bottom. Um, I think what's interesting about this design is that it, it showed a, a way to sort of deal with a convention, a, pr a preference for abstraction perhaps, and also a real sense of humor. The great event in, Saren, in Aliel Saren's second career as an architect came when he was a visiting professor at the University of Michigan, 1924 and 1925. This is a shot in the studio at Michigan, and look who's in front, Junior, still there in the studio. Two young men in the special class were J. Robert F. Swanson, who was to become his uh, son-in-law and Henry Scripps Booth, son of George G. Booth, who was publisher of the Detroit News. Swanson and Booth had opened a small practice and in part were working on elements of a private dream of the elder Booth, <clears throat> which was to become the creation of a collection of educational and artistic institutions known as Cranbrook outside Detroit in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Eliel was invited to undertake a master plan <coughs> for a series of institutions, a project that was to last nearly two decades. Both the elder Booth and the elder, Sar and the elder Saarinen found what they were looking for. Booth got an architect who was willing to listen to a client's needs and also shared the vision um, of the integration of the arts and crafts, and Saarinen got a client who was ready to invest in a project combining planning and architecture. This is uh, the model that was built at the time. You can see it's quite monumental. Young Arrow, who began his schooling in the fifth grade in Evanston, Illinois, advanced directly to the eighth grade when he attended high school the following year at a special progressive school <coughs> housed within the U of Michigan's uh, School of Education. He it was called the University High School. He was the first art editor of the first entirely student-run newspaper the broadcaster. You can see Arrow second from the uh, third from the uh, right um, in that photograph. He uh, was also the art editor <coughs> and illustrated the broadcaster with linoleum cut plates. Um, he lived at the age 15 in a number of, of homes uh, with construction all around him, among them being the Swanson House in Bloomfield Hills. Uh, his sister Pipson had eloped with Bob Swanson, and the family was able to move out of the farmhouse into uh, this fairly nice house. They lived in the garage apartment that was actually a four-car garage apartment. Um, Bob Swanson was quite wealthy. He attended nearby Baldwin High School in Birmingham, very much uh, an achiever, at least uh, socially and creatively, and graduated the semester ahead of schedule. Uh, one of the credits that's listed there is that um, he, was a, he, he had first place in the National Soap Sculpting, uh, Sculpting Contest, um, an interest that he began to cultivate in, in high school and entered into the program <coughs> that was conducted by Pro Procter & Gamble, um, very widespread program. There's actually been a recent scholarly article on the soap, soap carving of Irie Soap and took place uh, first place in 1958. This is his piece, which is in the archives at Procter & Gamble. In the final year of high school, Arrow began his collaboration with his father, working for the Cranbrook Architectural Office, 1928 to 1929. 
In the fall of 1929, immediately before the great crash, Arrow left for Paris to study sculpture at the Académie de la Grande Chaumière with Emile Antoine Bordel at the recommendation of Swedish sculptor and head of the Cranbrook sculpture program, Carl Millis. While Bordel died shortly after his arrival, there's strong evidence <laughs> to suggest that Arrow instead completed at least a portion of his studies with Aristide Naillot. Both artists <laughs> were from the Atelier of Rodin, and their work was considered to be quite modern, although rooted in the works of the classical tradition. They were also both interested in the integration of art and architecture, an interest with Arrow was to pursue upon his return to Cranbrook. <laughs> as he continued as an apprentice in the Cranbrook Architectural Office, young Arrow um, not only learned but basic principles of construction and detailing, but also executed a number of decorative features. Here he is doing, uh, he was doing uh, t uh, patterns in the brick. Here he is doing sculptural works, which actually wound up on some of the buildings. They're quite funny, actually. This is uh, at the Cranbrook School for Boys. He also did a, uh, a lounge in the Cranbrook School, these details, the tile work, and finally, <coughs> this bas relief, which is in the loggia of his father's house, the president's house at, at Cranbrook. And finally, this piece at the head of the stairs, which is at the... Um, Kingswood School for Girls, which is a kind of pun on Pegasus, uh, the, the horse with the flared um, tube, which is the, actually a lighting fixture, and um, Pegasus uh, carried the thunderbolts and lightning for, for Zeus, so the lighting fixture is kind of a pun of that. At age, four, at age 15, <coughs> he also took on the rebuilding of the north wing of the family house at Vitresque. This is the plan of Vitresque, and the piece that I'm talking about is this section right here um, that actually looked like this, which was a kind of Viking tower that burned um, around 1927, 1928, while the, while the Sirenans were in, uh, were in America, <coughs> and all that was left was the foundation. And Arrow took upon uh, rebuilding a little, little uh, house on that foundation to serve as a kind of guest house, I don't know if you can notice in the lower right-hand corner, he actually lists himself as Aero Saren, an architect. Here he is, all of 18 years old, <laughs> catching up to Frank Lloyd Wright, I guess. Um, this is what it looks like. It really, it's actually quite well integrated into the, uh, into the uh, uh, existing vocabulary. He was willing, in other words, to accept the limits of the given conditions, which I think is a characteristic that really ran through his entire career. Alio's work at Cranbrook underwent a transitional evolution during this uh, period in the decade, 1925 to 1935. And you can see at that point, uh, by the mid-30s, Alio was being recognized nationally. Here he is on the, uh, on the cover of Pencil Points, which eventually became progressive architecture in the 40s. With the early Cranbrook School for Boys, begun in 1926, Alio demonstrated the skill at combining two seemingly contradictory design aesthetics, the picturesque and the classical. <clears throat> medievalizing tendencies in building design and spatial composition of a more picturesque nature are more generalized and <clears throat> combined together with seemingly contradictory uh, means of classicizing moves, such as the use of axial alignments. Here you see the picturesque massing of the tower behind the entrance, and the, and the, but then suddenly the lamp is dead center, and it pulls the whole composition into an axial relationship. Here's another progression between two of the dormitories, at the, at the uh, School for Boys, <coughs> which come together as two book-ended uh, fire, uh, fireplace chimneys that axially uh, align with this piece at the end, and then another piece continues on and con turns the corner and is marked, the, the intersection is marked by this little gazebo. So on one surface it looks like it's picturesque, on the other surface it's actually Beaux-Arts. <coughs> By 1929, the Kingswood School for Girls exhibited planning that was more modern in terms of spatial expansion, symmetrical, asymmetrical in response to its site, particularly its a slope, sort of diagonally, <coughs> and functional disposition and simplified massing with more sparing use of ornamental variety. Its abstract spirit was at once art deco and related to the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. <coughs> in addition to symbolic metaphorical notes associated with the School for Girls, perhaps, such as the extensive use of these stepped uh, fluted columns, flared columns that, that seem to be abstracted uh, floral ornaments. After his return to Cranbrook from Paris, 
Arrow developed furniture designs 1930 to 1931. In fact, George Booth made him sign a contract in 1931 because he was 21. Didn't want to be exploiting child labor. <clears throat> this concurrently embraced the most avant-garde references as well as the most traditional. Both pieces are by Arrow. His uh, auditorium armchair for Kingswood on the left is a modernist steel tube with cantilever seat in the, in the manner of Bauhaus architects like Maud Sturm and Marcel Breuer and Finnish modernist Alvar Aalto, he, who he knew. The dining hall side chair, by contrast, is a traditional wood frame of uh, natural and pink painted birch with uh, reproduction linen upholstery. <coughs> By 1931, Eliel Saarinen was invited to speak at the annual convention of the American Institute of Architects in San Antonio, Texas, on his personal philosophy. He advocated a cautionary modernism, noting, quote, revolution is only evolution at more speed. The progressive part of the motor which gives the speed, the conservative part is the brake which prevents accidents. I see only evolution. And further, are we going to build our contemporary architecture in forms that do not mean anything? No! Three exclamation marks. At the same time, Arrow entered the Graduate School of Arts at Yale in the fall of 1931. Having completed Birmingham, Michigan's Baldwin High School in 1929 and never having attended undergraduate college, he became known to his classmates as Second Medal Saarinen for his consistent record <coughs> of uh, winning national design awards in the program of the Beaux-Arts Institute of Design. <coughs> this is from the um, college brochure, which reproduced one of, his first, uh, one of his first projects, the police station. It has a kind of similarity to <coughs> Kingswood. His projects exhibit a degree of basic clarity, which consistently made them attractive as early uh, first mentioned for this police station, and finally a single gestural mon uh, quality for the spearing prize and the sculptural directness of a monumental tunnel entrance, <coughs> where, as the jury noted, quote, by simply scooping out the rock in a semicircle at the tunnel entrance for a great height and cutting back huge steps in the face of the mountain at either side produce an approach monumental enough monumental though primitive in character and as enduring as the mountain itself, unquote. I call to your attention um, the, enter the elements at the base, <laughs> which uh, we'll see a little later in the talk. His thesis of 1924, a scheme to bring the Stevens Institute of Technology into more compact and efficient relations. Stevens is in Hoboken, New Jersey. It's also a competitor with NJIT, I should mention is organized along monumental lines dominated by a step tower derived from Aliel's Tribune Tower. Upon graduation, Sarnan was awarded both a traveling fellowship from Yale and a silver medal from the American branch of the Beaux-Arts Institute of Design for having the greatest number of design medals. <laughs> While with this, he traveled in Europe, visiting both historical sites and examples of the new modernism. These, these photographs, by the way, are from Arrow's personal uh, negative collection, which is at Yale, such as this post office by Aldoberto Libera, fascist modernist. <clears throat> you can see the AD Anno XII, which is the 12th year of the Mussolini period, or Vienna, Karl Marxhof <clears throat> by Karl Ayn. A return to Finland also brought Arrow into more direct <clears throat> contact with changes in aesthetic temperament re reflected in Scandinavian versions of modernism and in particular interpretations of the international style, especially the work of Gunnar Osplund in Stockholm, Sweden, and Alvar Aalto in Finland, who had uh, moved to Helsinki from Yveskele and completed the Paimio uh, Sanitarium and the Vipuri Library, both of which Eros saw. <clears throat> These works by Aalto, who, by the way, was to write the introduction to Albert Chris Janer's book, Aliel Siren and Sweet, a Finnish American Architect in 1948, um, delved into perceived changes in technology and aesthetic orientation, but reflected a critically non-ideological attitude, one more broadly based in its references in which Peter Smithson has characterized in Alto's case as being, quote, untheoretical, non-revolutionary, and unheroic. Arrow continued to enter competitions 
in his entry to the Helsinki Central Post Office and Telegraph Competition, cited, by the way, adjacent to Aliel's famous railway station, <clears throat> placed third with a design whose plan exhibits a modernist freedom in its relationship <clears throat> between structure and space planning, and whose exterior is abstract and very, very reductionist. As young Arrow worked on renovations and additions to the Swedish theater in Helsinki with an uncle, Jarl Eklund, who was advancing designs originally proposed by the Elder Sarn and in the competition winning design of 1916. Um, the notes on the bottom um, translate basically from Swedish, from Swedish that these, this is the uh, entry by um, Professor Sarn and it's signed by Jarl Eklund. It, uh, Arrow was there to develop the idea that the Swedish theater was a building from about the 1880s and the, the problem was to expand it and add a lot of facilities to it. So the question was how do you integrate old and new? <coughs> and Arrow did a range of studies, um, this being the more international style of the, of the lot. I love this drawing particularly because <coughs> as he's sketching various alternatives, there on the lower right corner is Pappy Saren and blaring. <laughs> and finally, this is the final version. Um, it's interesting that it's signed on the lower right, both by Jarl Eklund and Eero Saarinen. In late 1936, a practice was initiated outside the work of the Cranberg Architectural Office as Elio Saarinen and Eero Saarinen. <clears throat> In the first uh, five years which followed, projects were executed under a variety of collaborations and began to suggest the presence of younger minds from the Cranbrook community. In 1934 and 1938, Cranbrook undertook its Institute of Science, whose design reflected a more modern sensibility, abstracted form, articulations of program through massing, which is actually a fairly complicated building because it actually made use of an existing piece that was in a kind of donut-shaped courtyard. One wing was kept, and then the building was actually built on the foundations, much like Vitrest, uh, of the previous building and then extended to become the Institute of Science. This is a picture I took some years ago which shows Stephen Hull's uh, new addition at the rear and the addition of the planetarium which was done in the 1950s. <laughs> this is a vintage photograph showing it at the date of completion, sculptures by Carl Millis in the reflecting pool. But the most amazing thing obviously is the cantilever canopy which is amazingly thin and there's no way Aliel Saarinen would have ever done that. So clearly the young guys are exerting their influence. A previously <coughs> unknown project in 1937 for a residence at Gross Point, Michigan, by the Charles Koble House, Koble was a, a Swede, <coughs> is the first built independent project of Siren and Siren and collaboration. It's actually jo job number 19371, 1937 one. <coughs> the original design with the horizontal strip banding, which you can see in the elevation, um, was a provocatively modernistic for Gross Point. I don't know if you've ever been to Gross Point, but it is a colonial city. This must have been like a real eyesore. <coughs> uh, the more sedate built version was actually completed by son-in-law Robert Swanson with interiors developed by Arrow's sister Pipson, Siren and Swanson, <coughs> and decorative sculpture in the dining room, which was executed by Arrow's wife, Lily Swan. It's in that that little alcove at the rear, the curved alcove, has a p number of uh, sculptural pieces that Lily did. The Fenton Community Center, job number 19372 <coughs> of the same year, continued this combination of Aliel's motif with the approach of greater simplicity. Arrow was clearly pushing <coughs> for the inclusion of more abstracted motifs and more advanced design, even resisting the use of traditional carved stone lettering as was noted in the letter dated August 20th, 1937, stating, quote, Mr. Saarinen's man Weber advises that young Mr. Saarinen is still very anxious to have metal lettering next. <laughs> Didn't happen. As the Fenton project was winding down in 1938, Arrow was invited by Yale graduate several years as senior, Worthen Paxton of the office of Norman Belgettis, to participate in the design of the General Motors Pavilion for the 1939 World's Fair. Arrow was primarily responsible for the building concept for enclosing the Futurama exhibition <coughs> and exercising and streamlined design, <coughs> which had been virtually invented by Belgettis and described in his 1932 book, Horizons, where industrial design was perhaps first invented. Its sculptural aspects are obvious, but streamlining was also appeared as a possible way 
of giving form to emerging contemporary industrialized building technologies. While in the Bel Geddes office, <coughs> Arrow placed fifth in the entry to the Wheaton College Art Center competition, organized as a modernist pinwheel composition. Later in 1938, in collaboration with his father, Aliel, he placed second in a design for Goucher College, uh, which was a campus plan and library competition, where site planning combines the classical lines of Aliel with asymmetrical and continuous spatial ideas. These same elements were shown in the first <coughs> prize entry for a festival theater and fine arts building at the College of William and Mary in 1939, which Arrow won with uh, Frederick James, who went on to become a painter, and Ralph Rapson, who, of course, was a very important architect in Minneapolis, and who recently passed away. He was a great guy also. The dynamic con uh, centripetal composition um, echoes, perhaps, Bauhaus concepts. This expansive uh, geometry contrasts with a more centralized classical vocabulary that had characterized Aliel Saarinen's planning at Cranbrook. <coughs> It's after this period that the Saarinen's practice exhibits a continuing presence of modernism, although the range of influence reflects their clients with traditional clients um, having the more, more uh, traditional architectural references with a modernist design exhibiting Arrow's emerging belief in technological determinism. Others in the office during the early years, 1938 to 1941, included a number of Cranbrook people, <clears throat> among them being Ralph Rapson, as I mentioned, and designer Charles Eames. The 1938 to 1940 Kleinhans Auditorium for Buffalo, New York was the first major work <coughs> to win national recognition. And with its outward form suggests the classicism of Aliel in the sense that they're symmetrical. The somewhat standard uh, streamlined plan and its interiors and specifically the furniture are more progressively modern. The plan parenthetically has always reminded me somewhat of the 1932 stub-nosed GB R2 racing airplane. I, I can't believe that there's no connection. It's too, it's too obvious with the short wings and the stubby front. It, it was the asymmetric, it was the central uh, external symmetrical representational aspect that disturbed critics such as Joseph Hudnut, dean of the graduate school uh, of, at Harvard. Just, just some of the interiors. Um, Eames and Rapson worked on the interiors primarily, and, and Arrow designed the furniture. And the exterior, that's the fire stair that's cascading down the side, by the way. It's sort of a, a neat thing. <clears throat> but Joe Hudnut, who actually had been a great supporter of the Saarinens, <clears throat> was at Harvard, and by then he had, he had brought Walter Gropius and wrote critically in the July 1941 architectural forum of, quote, a new eloquence of architecture, the sources of which are those necessities that underlie and direct its outward forms, in other words, functionalism. All parts are coordinated to give a sense of a single organism. This is the thrilling fact about modern architecture. The adjustments and distortions of the modern architect are made not in the interest of a general harmony of form, but a harmony of energies. It is a pity, I think, that these meanings could not have been made more evident on the exterior form of the building. I should have preferred a functional form. This defeat of an organic unity is not compensated for by that warmth in texture and color, that perfection in detail, that serene candor, which combined here have always sustained the great and just renown of Aliel Saarinen, unquote. This critical admiration, if you will, with the Saarinens predicted the impending dichotomy of son from father, <clears throat> but all the while the non-ideological base of their work and the Saarinen architecture program at Cranbrook, free as it was of dogma, <clears throat> could comfortably fit a variety of significant modernist personalities, even those as ideologically divergent from one another as Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier. In contrast, the most provocative design of the period is the Winnetka School, the Southwest School, <coughs> known as Crow Island. It was originally the Northwest School, but became the Southwest School when it moved sites. This early drawing, by the way, is by Arrow. Its articulation combines innovative functional <coughs> and progressive education pro uh, planning with a combination of crafts and technology that softens its image from the hard edge international style which had been introduced into the United States. The asymmetrical clock uh, on the vertical pylon, um, which is the furnace flue, the asymmetrical clock was a debate between Arrow and, and Aliel. Um, 
the planning of the interior, the, the pipe columns and the metal windows are industrial products, but the overall feeling with the brick wall and particularly the terracotta figures on the rear, which were done by Lily Swan Saarinen, give it a kind of home-like atmosphere. This is the entrance lobby to the school. And finally, the classrooms themselves. Um, and also the lighting, by the way, which is recessed lighting in the classrooms, <coughs> which was done by Eros uh, lighting teacher at Yale, Stanley McCandless. And the idea of the, the units defining courtyards that the children could immediately relate to in the corner windows, all those are modernist touches. At the same time, uh, yeah, here we go. The, the Smithsonian Competition of Art of 1939 further established the Saarinen office as a modernist firm. In a team that included brother-in-law J. Robert F. Swanson, actually I seem to be a little out of sequence here. Let me go, here we go. The period of 1939 to 41 was of intense collaboration between Arrow and Charles Eames. Charles is shown here on the left with um, uh, George Booth looking at an exhibition um, for faculty that the Arrow and uh, Eames designed. You can see here, um, which is in an Albert Kahn interior, demonstrates their commitment to technological innovation. The planar display panels, tensile rods which grid the space, the cantilever display bases. Here is the Kleinhans Theater um, on its base. Take a, a close look at that base in just a second. <clears throat> These are all the exercises in extracting the most dynamic possibilities from materials reduced to their lightest, most efficient form. This famous portrait of Arrow and Charlie is actually on the base. They flipped the base over, they plopped themselves on top of it, and they're demonstrating the ultimate faith in the strength of modern materials. And finally, the Smithsonian competition, <clears throat> the firm submitting it was Aliel Siren and then Arrow Siren and J. Robert F. Swanson, associate. Bob Swanson's on the left, Aliel in the middle, Arrow on the right. Also included Ralph Rapson and Charlie Eames. Arrow took the design direction by rationally exploring ele elements of program to establish probable functional relationships rather than a predetermined formal image. Functional areas were closely arranged, but clearly and separately articulated, and a degree of aformalism is suggested by certain components allowing indeterminate future expansion. Motifs such as long horizontal expanses of glass, precise, thin-walled, contained volumes, <coughs> and open flexible spaces organized around a consistent module are certainly modern. These are tempered by applied decoration, a careful balanced composition of the volumes, the traditional formal element of a reflecting pool and a certain degree of uh, monumentalism and dignified restraint reflective of the hand of Aliel Saarinen. At the same time, the Cranbrook Academy <coughs> Library and Museum in 1940-1943, designed independently by Aliel Saarinen, while described in the architectural press as the last modern art museum built before World War II, was compositionally, materially, and representationally <coughs> from an era passing into what was to become a period piece. By the 1940s, Arrow was exploring new uses of building technology and architecture related to the expression of the evocation of program. His, his opera house for Tanglewood, the summer home of the Boston Symphony, had a roof system employing tensile structures, stainless steel rods, in turn supported by the then innovative laminated uh, wood arch beams, uh, facilitating an, in, an internal clear span and also a stepped interior uh, ceiling for acoustical reasons. Its materials, moreover, also suggest the barn vocabulary and agrarian vernacular of rural Massachusetts. Its relationship, I think, to Le Corbusier's 1931 Palace of the Soviets is also obvious, as that arch form will appear again later. Two residential works of 1940 to 42 further the modernist convictions of, a of Aero Saarinen. The Samuel Bell House project for New Hope, Pennsylvania, <coughs> which had the unfortunately scheduled bid opening date of Monday, December 8th, 1941, the day after Pearl Harbor, killed that project. Um, and the A.C. Wormuth House of 1940 to 42 near Fort Wayne, Indiana. Wormuth was the contractor for Cranbrook. Both articulate program and Wormuth's regular here, this is uh, the model of the bell house and those columns. I'm sure the architects in the audience have seen a lot of those lately in the press. This is the Wormuth house. Its irregular plan accommodates to its site. 
splits the program into public-private blocks and reflects contemporary work by Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer, including the use of indigenous materials such as native field stone and white clabbered siding on the, uh, the bedroom wing is the raised wing on the, on the left. It sits on a, uh, a ravine. <clears throat> These drawings are by Arrow, and they're fantastic, actually, modern drawings, which owe a lot to Le Corbusier. I mean, that, that chimney is a three-part chimney. It's a kind of wiggle, um, much like the top of the Marseille block, but here 30 years earlier or 25 years earlier. There are also three fireplaces. There's one in the kitchen, there's one in the dining room, and there's one in the living room. They're all sort of in that nexus where you can serve them all. The kitchen one is kind of interesting because it has five slots that, are, that next to the uh, fireplace that are labeled well done to rare. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what was going on there. <clears throat> Wartime brought the formation of a new office, Sarinen and Swanson, and national recognition for defense housing projects and housing design, such as the inclusion in the Museum of Modern Art's 1942 exhibition, Wartime Housing. On the upper right, not these but these, and the first one on but these is um, a project that is done, is the architect is credited as Aero Sarnen, which is kind of unusual because actually they would have promoted the, uh, the name of the firm, but I think he had this thing about his brother-in-law having his name on the door at the time. Uh, this is in Centerline, Michigan, which is still a viable community. It's actually a starter home community and a retirees community, a mixed, mixed uh, family income. It's a co-op. It was co-op immediately after the war and still exists. Arrow served as a civilian <coughs> in the uh, Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, uh, and ran a small office of Siren and Swanson <coughs> in Washington, D.C. They were working on public housing uh, in D.C., which I've actually seen, which is still there. It's an unpublished project. It's pretty interesting. Um, before joining the OSS um, in 1942, Arrow executed the Community House Project for U.S. Gypsum Company. They had just invented sheetrock um, and were promoting its use. The design was a, quote, demountable space. I show it here as it's included in a uh, uh, publication in the Architectural Forum called The Prefabricated House, which I think is kind of ironic since we just had this exhibit at the MoMA called, the pre you know, on the prefabrication housing. Um, so things come around, I guess, every 60 years. <laughs> the, the demountable space modular building based on cent a central mask Mast from which was hung a tensile roof, no doubt inspired by Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion House of 1929. Siren and Fuller were to meet in Washington during the war years. Its facade reflected an inter a, um, inter indeterminate program of a variety of uses for post-war communities. It could be extended and in composition trans transfigured and reconfigured, while services were, were kept as these little plug-on elements. I don't know if you can, I don't know if I can do it with this thing here. They seem to be pretty limp here, I don't know why. Uh, right, this guy here is a plug-in element, sort of an aluminum rounded edge thing, which is very reminiscent of, uh, say, Japanese architecture of the 60s, uh, metabolists and so on, the notion of plug-in components. His unfolding house of 1943 for the Kellett Aircraft Corporation and the Knoll Design Group proposed factory-made trailer units which could be combined together. You can see it's un unpacked up here. There's arrived, it's unpacked, it's expanded, and made into a house. <clears throat> With his colleague from the OSS, Oliver Lundquist, who was also Swedish, Sarinen won first prize in the Designs for Postwar Living competition sponsored by Arts and Architecture magazine. <clears throat> With another factory produced, PAC, was called the PAC House, pre assembled component. The service corps was pre assembled, and then it could be combined together in alternative arrangements. This was compositionally a formal and open-ended, lightweight, industrially inspired, technologically advanced architecture. During the period and a prospect of resumed construction following the war, the Siren and Swanson office <coughs> pursued a series of more real-world projects, usually in association with more established firms. The beginning of the Des Moines Art Center's first phase designs exhibits the classical planning motifs and monumentality of the elder Siren. And if you see the, well, you can see the extent of it, and also take a note of this little piece here, this little staircase. That was to be the front door. You can see the size of the people. Uh, a, little, a little monumental. In some ways, the compositional strategies em employed in the subsequent downscaling, which shows here, 
and massing as reflective of programmatic requirements suggests those which have been introduced by the younger designers, Arrow and his friends. Its realization was through association with the Des Moines firm of Brooks Borg. <clears throat> While the interiors recalled some of the modernist features of the Kleinhans Music Hall, the exterior embraces the traditional and recalls the, the critical remarks made five years earlier by Joseph Hudnut. While its methods of construction and techniques are techniques far removed from those technological investigations of the younger Saarinen, basically a wed mutt, wed mutt system. The Fort Wayne, Indiana Art School and Museum of 1945 to 1946, I also love the way they misspelled Wayne, <laughs> um, bears a strong similarity to the final scheme for Des Moines. And the First Baptist Church of Flint, Michigan of 1946 evokes both <clears throat> the pinwheel plan form compositions as well as the more serene stripped classical motifs of Eliel's work as seen in the First Christian Church, originally called the Tabernacle Church of Christ in Columbus, Indiana of 1939 to 1942. As a footnote, it was the Miller family of Columbus who, who uh, were the clients for the Columbus Church project and members of the Disciples of Christ denomination, which I think probably is one of the connections here at Drake. Ultimately, this resulted in the future commissions for Arrow through J. Irwin Miller, son of the family, which included two houses for Mr. Miller and his wife, Xenia, and the, Fort, the Irwin Union Trust Building, the prototypical post-war branch bank of Idiot Had Drive-In facilities of 1950 to 55, whose visual vocabulary has an affinity to those buildings here at Drake. In Des Moines, Drake University also became an example of the evolving transitions in the Saren and design strategies. Early master planning, and this is Bob Swanson on the left, this picture also appears in Morris' exhibit, President Harmon in the middle and Ailey on the right. Early design studies <coughs> um, commencing in 46 and pub published in an official version in 1947 as a 13-page feature in architectural record, um, joined a series of campus schemes coming out of the office in that decade such as, by comparison, a master plan for Louisiana State University of 1946. And while they both came to embody and enhance the <coughs> principles of planning closely associated with Aliel Siren and the Cranbrook Architecture Department, their compositional and spatial qualities began to seem a little dated. By the end of the war, the Siren office was nationally known, and the singularity of Aliel's prominence was replaced by the influence of Arrow as a co-equal. Uh, here they are father and son, with the boys from GM. The partnership with Robert Swanson, which had been formalized in 1941, continued in 1946 under the name Saarinen and Swanson and Saarinen, but was to be replaced and terminated in 1947 as the practice became Saarinen, Saarinen and Associates and a second firm of Swanson Associates. <clears throat> the most important element in this transition was the project for GM announced in 1945. The first proposal for the GMTC was critical, as it suggests in many ways the end of certain preoccupations as well as the beginning of continuity with others. Certainly, the presence of a large unifying formal element as the lake and both the interplay of horizontal and, and vertical forms, I sound like an art historian here, the interplay of horizontal and vertical elements um, punctuated um, the relationship and have precedent in their collaborative work. However, the overall feeling is functionalist and a kind of industrialized campus organized in principles evoked by the 1939 City of Tomorrow <coughs> at, Norman, at Norman Bell Geddes GM Futurama. This perspective, oh here, this is another study of some of the, build, the early buildings at GM. And this perspective by lower right hand corner, you can just make it out, Aero Saarinen, um, emphasizes the continuity of movement by a continuous canopy podium. This theme was developed further in 1947, <coughs> this rendering by um, uh, Hugh Ferris, who was the official renderer and delineator for the Bel Geddes office. Arrow was imposing an image from which he, he sought a means to express the essence of modernism in a new cultural context. He was really wrestling with this idea of streamlining. A second version of GM followed after the project had been stopped for nearly half a year by a major UAW strike, and its revised organization and approach in individual buildings <coughs> repudiated those of the earlier schemes and reflected principles of Bauhaus Chicago architect Mies van der Rohe in his plans for the Illinois Institute of Technology. 
But in contrast to the more static, nearly neoclassical groupings at IIT, evidence of didactic, dialectic interplay <coughs> between objectivity and romantic subjectivity, such as this phase here, which contained an office building directly on the lake. The death to Mies is clear from this letter that Eero Saarinen carefully crafted on Thanksgiving Day in 1948, expressing his thanks to Mies for a tour of IIT. He observed, quote, I feel your buildings at Illinois Tech will have a tremendous impact on American architecture from now on. I think it will be a most positive force. The message of complete honesty and integrity <coughs> which they carry should set off a re-examination of values in the mind of many an architect, including my own. Subsequently, Mies thought enough of Saarinen <clears throat> that he invited him to give the dedication address for the opening of Crown Hall at IIT. When Arrow Saarinen appeared on the cover <clears throat> of Time Magazine in 1956, it was the plan of General Motors, which was the background image uh, and the, and the, for the theme issue, which was entitled Maturing Modern. I should note also that this construction documents for GM were possible because of the associate architects of Smith, Hinchman, and Grills of Detroit. Saarinen, in turn, began to employ these precise spatial principles in other work, as in the subsequent refinements of the Drake Master Plan of the early 1950s, as the firm emerged as Aero Saarinen and Associates. The Miesian principles evidence that Drake subsequently appear in master plans also for Yale, Michigan, and the University of Chicago. These are some of the studies for Drake, showing the uh, big auditorium proposal, and finally the official plan of 1950, the future. Meredith building is more or less here. Um, this is Yale, Hill House Avenue, where he's doing these interventions, which have similarities. The North Campus at Michigan, same deal. In fact, oh my god, look, there's a circle. <laughs> and the University of Chicago master plan, for which he did the, um, the law school, ultimately, and also a, a um, um, dormitory grouping, which has now been torn down. <coughs> Harvey Ingman Hall of Science and the Fitch Hall of Pharmacy are the first project designed and built 46 to 49 by means of collaboration with Brooks Borg of Des Moines. In a monumental 24-page feature in progressive architecture in November 1950, the buildings were, were cited for their clear analysis of functional and technological needs, including modular planning, efficient circulation, massing in, in order to keep cubage to a minimum, that's to say surface area, an integration of mechanical services. The structure comprises structural steel <coughs> with both welded and riveted connections, reinforced concrete, which had ceiling covers to integrate lighting and service pipes and load-bearing masonry. Its most distinguishing features are those which embrace the aesthetic of Mies van der Rohe and served as precursors to the General Motors tech buildings, which was just there beginning to be designed. Uh, the glass box and the non-structural curtain walls <laughs> due in part to structures semi-cantilever design, which pulls the envelope free of the column grid. In detail, elements such as the staircase and connecting bridge evoke uh, Mies' work at IIT. These are some of my photographs <laughs> of some years ago. It's nice to see them again, actually, and see what it was like. When you can actually see the buildings. <laughs> this is almost like a direct quotation, which I think uh, Mora points out in her exhibit of Mises uh, staircases on IIT. Widely circulated in the press. My, I love this bridge. It's one of my favorite elements. And here's Mies. Or here's uh, GM carrying the theme further. Almost indistinguishable except for size from Drake. And again, the formal element of the, of the pool. And finally, um, I'm not, this is not in proper chronological uh, detail, uh, the sequence, but I want to show the Charles Medbury Hall and Orion Scott Chapel of 53 to 55, uh, continuing these themes, and also a variant of other Saarinen designs. An interesting letter written to his soon-to-be future wife, Aline Laukheim, ev evidences <coughs> Eero Saarinen's wide-ranging and eclectic thinking. The site plan position positions a contextual relationship. I think it's kind of interesting that he talks about it at that scale, um, including this cross-campus axes. The honorific positioning of a possible future chapel over here, which is shown here, um, 
And she says, main future chapel, we may get in trouble on this one later, combining circle and rectangle, which may be degenerate. I, I, I love that. Of course, Philip Johnson did a chapel like that at, uh, at St. Thomas University in Houston, and it is degenerate. I would agree with Aaron. He was right, right on. Um, and also the resolution of site-specific conditions, which he talks about, I believe, right here, um, the retaining wall, which uh, Professor Lyons observes in her catalog. The retaining wall to the east of Medbury Hall in <coughs> indicates the changing grade of the site while also framing the building. He even cites the columns in the dormitory grouping bridge down here, which we'll see in just a few minutes, and freely admits cribbing a detail down here um, from Cal that he saw in the work of California architect Ernest J. Kump in the lower, in the lower corner. It says, all interior walls off columns, parentheses, Kump did this in a school once. <laughs> it's great. Um, continuing the previous aesthetic uh, schemes, Medbury, and here's, by the way, here's the kind of thing he was looking for, the columns free of the wall, kind of beautifully articulated. <clears throat> the, um, continuing the themes of uh, the previous schemes, Medbury Hall's south-facing facade incorporated past tense metal sunshading devices, similar to the work of Marcel Breuer, which we would now call passive sustainable design. <laughs> it's the chapel, however, <clears throat> which is one of several designs employing the drum and block party. The blank exterior with the light-filled interior has an affinity with Saarinen's uh, Interfaith Chapel of 1951 at Brandeis University, illuminated from above, and also a connection to the MIT Chapel. This is the original scheme for the MIT Chapel. It was a rectangle. And finally, it became a drum connected to a low building in case you didn't get it, right? And then I say that if you take, if you take uh, Brandeis and you slip it in the Drake, you get MIT. It's the evolution of the dormitories, which we now, I think, have to politically call residences. Um, beginning in 1945, um, here as sort of boomerang forms, and a subsequent study in the 1960s showing the sort of influence of the Miesian aesthetic, and finally the versions uh, combining Carpenter, Crawford, and Stalnaker Hall, and the Hubble facility, the dining facility, and then finally the fourth dorm, Harriet Hall, 1955 to 58. The landscape element of the pond and the ravine, bring back the pond, comments on the board at the exhibit, should be come back, should come back. It's safe to bring it back. <laughs> um, which was a common feature for Saarinen and buildings, is really, I think, unfortunately lost. The initial phase also was substantially published in Progressive Architecture in a 10-page feature in April 1955. At this juncture, Aero Saarinen undertook to redesign free of his brother-in-law and, and his own firm, successor to the line of partnerships with his father, Elio. It was, again, architectural technology that drove the tectonics of this project as Aero eclectically appropriated a construction technique which had been developed by his engineering consultant, the brilliant Norwegian-American architect uh, engineer, Fred Severud, who had described in his December 1949 article, Forecasting a New Era for Concrete, an architectural record, a concept of densing, which induces compression into concrete equal to or greater than the tension caused by internal friction resistance in the first hours of a pour, such, as the concrete, such that the concrete sets up under compression during its early hours. It's different from pre-stressing, both in terms of the magnitude of force and the time of application. Pre-stressing can be applied in its final hardening stages. Uh, precast panels would be poured horizontally and densed. This leads to a demonstration in the use of the use slick system of pouring concrete slabs on the ground in stacks, cutting them, curing them for 10 days, and then jacking them up. This photograph, which is from the Saarinen Archive, is from the, um, a, a Severed application at Trinity College at San, in San Antonio of 1950. Um, done by Arrow's friends, O'Neill Ford of Texas and William Worcester, who was a consulting architect of San Francisco. 
and the dean at MIT. Um, all campus buildings were erected with this system, shown in this, this photograph. Drake at, Drake, at the time, the most important real work in the office, aside from the GM Tech Center, and in this case, a job over which the practice had complete design and production control, to the extent that there were numerous presentation and design drawings, as well as large study models. The final grouping and the pedestrian system of connecting bridges to social spaces are an interesting example of 1950s campus facilities. I'll just quickly run through some of the models. These models are amazing. It's too bad they're not still around. There are those posts that he sketched in his little note to Aline. And they were, the magazines were interested in every detail of, this, of these projects. While Time Magazine had heralded the Des Moines Arts Center in 1948 it, as the first modern museum built after World War II, the July 1949 issue of the Architectural Forum magazine quite possibly tells it quite more, more clearly. The opening or lead article is the Des Moines Arts Center, perhaps in no small way due as a deferential nod to the senior Saarinen, who in fact was about a year away from his own death in 1950. What is telling, however, is the cover of the magazine, which features the new designs for the General Motors Tech Center, whose visual themes are generally acknowledged as being from the junior Saarinen. This careful partitioning yet dichotomous balancing of the two Saarinens reflects the ultimate formal distance between father and son by 1950. <clears throat> In a 1959 letter by Peggy Patrick from the Des Moines Art Center, addressed to the Office of Aero Saarinen and Associates requesting some images for use in a museum educational program, Aline Saarinen, Aero's wife by now and savvy former New York Times art critic, drew a line firm to her secretary to reply, lest there be any, future, any further confusion. Please write a gracious underlined letter telling them the building is by alial underlined Saarinen and do they want picture of his underlined building? I should, I should parenthetically note that I am astounded that the Drake University buildings are missing from the fest shrift that Aline put together immediately following Arrow's death in three printings of 1963 to 1968, Arrow Saarinen on his work. Aline married Arrow in 1953, was heavily involved in the publishing end of Arrow Saarinen and Associates, and I've always contended that works pre preceding her marriage would, in principle, not be included as major works. In spite of the dining hall and dormitories having received in 1955 both the first honor award of the National Awards Program of the American Institute of Architects and also the first honor award from the Detroit chapter, American Institute of Architects. Eero Saarinen's initial belief in modernism had been firm, and he both echoed and expanded upon his father as he stated, quote, <clears throat> within our own time it is more a matter of expansion than change. Sounds a lot like the 1931 speech. The principle of functional integrity seems to be one of the keystone principles of modern architecture. Structural integrity and structural clarity were basic principles. However, he also declared, quote, that today's buildings fall utterly short by not even recognizing the spiritual side of architecture and the greater spiritual meaning of architecture to our civilization. His search for an American modern architecture was to become which sought to synthesize the spiritual dimension with a technologically abstracted form. In 1948, concurrent with the completion of the Des Moines Art Center, both Saarinens submitted entries to the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial Competition in St. Louis. And this is a, an exhibit held uh, after the winning of the prize. And I just wanted to point out that it, it is to Saarinen, Saarinen, and Associates. This is the father's entry. And of course, you've seen the son's entry board. Uh, this wasn't the first time they did this, by the way. Four years earlier, they had submitted separate entries to a legislative palace for Ecuador competition in 1944. <clears throat> the true story goes that the congratula congratulatory telegram arrived addressed to Aliel Saarinen. <clears throat> but a day later, a second telegram arrived clarifying that it was Aero Saarinen who was the winner and also an apologetic note from George Howe, who was chairman of the department at Yale and had actually had, actually invited Junior a year later to be a design critic at Yale in 1949. The search for form had at last been rewarded. His so-called St. Louis Arch, 
synthesize the qualities of abstraction, monumentality, and structural daring with a stainless steel <coughs> arch derived, again, by engineer Fred Severud from the logical natural geometry of a catenary curve, eventually designed to 630 feet in height. Possibly the greatest public monument produced in the period of modern architecture, it is also metaphorical in its illusions, consciously symbolizing the idea of a gateway to the West, combining technological determinism with symbolic representation. And I, I think a case can be made that this arch has precedence in other <laughs> earlier Saarinen projects, as we've seen. As Peter, Cook, as Peter Carter observed, Eero Saarinen was aware of today's technology in its widest sense, and he used its potential as a means of achieving a many-faceted architectural expression within the tradition of modern masters. To advance the symbolic and environmental content of the tradition, he explored special architectural vernaculars for each project. It precluded the possibility of a personal style, a fact which set him apart from any of his contemporaries. But the question of expression, seen in the diversity of Eero Saarinen's last decade of production, begs the question of his apparent willingness to acknowledge a role for background buildings. <coughs> From Eero Saarinen on his work, these quotes. Perhaps expression does not seem too much of a problem for the ordinary buildings that are really just part of what we might call the buildingscape, a sort of background scenery. But I think they would, we would argue that even these should have an expression, the modest one of being what they are. And further, quote, different areas of a campus can have different characters but we could stand more unity within each area. I am longing for monotony, unquote. The essentials of uh, the ensemble of Drake's buildings, perhaps uh, an industrial voc vocabulary, in fact are not neutral, but multivalent in the formal strategies that shaped and underscored a collective environment. The curtain wall at the IBM manufacturing plant in Rochester, Minnesota, birthplace of the first computer, by the way, <clears throat> unifies a complex program of varying spatial needs within a flexible modular container providing multiple combinations. The IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Center at Yorktown Heights, New York, <clears throat> is curved to embrace a hillside uh, slope and its continuous facade is in fact a social space containing lounges for all employees. You can see them in the transparent end curving around. You never, you never see the corridor, you always see just a fragment of the corridor. And every time you turn a transition, there's a lounge. All, corridor, all service corridors lead to this main sort of arcade. The faceted law school of the University of Chicago makes a courtyard in unity with the existing Gothic Revival dorm. Noyes House at Vassar College is inflected to make a campus edge to contain an existing circular green. And finally, the Western Electric Company headquarters for Bell Labs in Holmdale, New Jersey is set in the landscape and centers on perhaps the first atrium office building in the United States. It's also the first mirror glass building in the United States. In conclusion, Eero Saarinen's heterodoxy in design, this image of him descending a mock-up of the staircase um, to the Mississippi River in front of the, the St. Louis Arch, is set against his own office building in, in Birmingham, which is another modular curtain wall facade that Professor uh, Lyons describes in her exhibit. As critic Kenneth Frampton has described in <coughs> this direction, it is an approach where, quote, minimalism exploits both the sensational and the mute nature of modern production. A, quote, silence, quote, that can neither be masked nor significantly transcended. The imperative task of the architect today is to master the means of production, not only for the sake of regaining control over the act of building, but also, presumably, so as to participate consciously in the production of meaning. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, you mentioned in your exhibit that building constitutes a landscape for design and effort. Yes. Um, do you ever think about. It was actually won by Ralph Rapson. Okay. <laughs> um, do you ever think about how uh, the Sarian environment and design relates more generally to uh, the kind of building and condemnation of empire at that time? You know, 
Well, I don't think Ecuador, well, I don't think we own Ecuador still. Um, I think more important would be the uh, program with the um, State Department and the embassy program following, let's say, 1952 or so. With the, the advent of the Eisenhower administration, <coughs> there was a, um, there were a group of people, some of whom were connected to Yale, that were within the um, um, State Department and really were advancing modernism as being reflective of American ideals and democracy. And that's why a lot of them were very open, which has caused problems in recent years. Uh, for example, the London Embassy had a very transparent base. The Oslo Embassy by Eros Arendt also has a central courtyard that you can just come right into, that all the offices are around. Um, and there was a lot of controversy nationally about what was still appropriate, modernism being appropriate or not, to the extent that um, the head of the foreign building operations actually constructed an advisory committee of which Saarinen was a member. Um, so it was kind of stacked in the favor of modernism, but clearly it was to choose architects whose work would be seen as progressive and that America would be seen as progressive. Similarly, the choice to um, give the uh, Air Force Academy a competition um, was given to SOM out of Chicago, and um, the secretary also created an advisory committee, and Errol Saarinen was on the committee, as was Pietro Belushi, Wally, Wally Harrison of Harrison Abramovitz was first on it, but withdrew because he had to do Lincoln Center. Um, and uh, Welton Beckett of California, who was also a modernist who had practiced in Detroit, was added to the committee. So these were all sort of meant to advance the image of modernism as, as being progressive. So I think in, that's the, in that case, it was political. Yes? Mm -hmm. Socialism, communism, democracy, and so on. Where do you think we stand now with modernism? And if these things change within the next 20 years, how does it affect how people view the perspective? I think, modern, I think modernism was always a threat. I mean, the, the Russian constructivists <coughs> were basically squelched by Stalin, who favored a kind of uh, overblown classicism. Um, the, the Nazis got rid of the modernists pretty quickly because there were too many Jews on the faculty for one thing. Um, and Hitler obviously favored a classicism, kind of stripped down classicism. So, and the, the, the Bauhaus masters who fled to England found that modernism was kind of rough going in the UK as well. And most of the early modernists in the UK were in fact, um, they were British citizens, but they weren't English. They were New Zealanders and Canadians or, Welton, uh, or uh, Berthold Lubetkin of Tecton uh, was in fact a white Russian. He was a non-communist uh, czarist Russian who had emigrated to, uh, to, the, to the Soviet Union. I think Martin is making a comeback, frankly. I think that um, the turmoil, well, had its rough spots, right? Um, and certainly, Aerosarin, we were talking last night about the fact that by the time I was in college, uh, the date of which I won't reveal, um, but was asked to, by my um, seminar critic, Peter Eisenman, to write a paper, oh, here I was a little 20-year-old kid, right? Write a paper on an architect whose work I like. So I wrote this paper on Eero Saarinen, and boy, was I crucified um, for having chosen Saarinen. That was in 64. It was three years after his death, and he was already in decline. I mean, he, no one was paying attention to Saarinen. I think it had to do with the fact that his clients were major military industrial uh, <laughs> complexes and institutions that were regarded as being somewhat um, um, controlling, like universities. Um, you know, it was four years later in 1968 when things really hit the fan uh, with the universities, protests, uh, you know, Columbia's policy towards Harlem, all that stuff. Um, the a and building at Yale burned in 1970, 69, 70. Um, so that I think, and even Vincent Scully wrote some really nasty remarks about Saren and, and his, uh, his successors, um, Kevin Roach, all of which has now come back and Vince is very contrite about Saren and 
and talks well about them. But the uh, reaction to the, there are obvious failures, I think, and I think it had to do with the fact that, that the contextual interests that Sirenin had, both father and son, they always had it. I mean, they, they had this thankless job of the um, Detroit Civic Center. It was a thankless job. Um, it started in the 30s, and post-war period was very intense, looking at studies for the Detroit Civic Center, which Arrow was very much involved in. Um, and he went to hearing after hearing after hearing, addressing the, the points of contention for the, for the planning of the Civic Center. And what a thankless job, but he did it. And at the same time, they were doing the, um, the college campuses. There's a whole string of college campuses, Antioch, Brandeis, obviously here, Stevens uh, in, um, in Missouri, and, and so on, Yale, a really long study for Yale campus planning. So he really believed in the, the context of the environment as being a setting for buildings, not buildings just plopped around. Um, so yes, he did very figural buildings. Obviously, TWA comes to mind. But if you really understand TWA, and I, I refer to my article on Casabella of a few years ago where I wrote about TWA, it's its shape, the bird shape, which might have a kind of uh, metaphorical illusion, the more important thing is that it was sighted right on axis with the approach road. Not the center line of the in and out, but on the right hand side, as you drove into Idlewild, there, there was the, uh, the building sighted right on axis. The whole thing about Dulles, I think the whole approach to Dullus, the idea of Dulles, for one thing, um, a, a, uh, a dispersed uh, system of uh, getting to, to and from the airplanes, but the siding of it is an environmental thing, and he collaborated a lot with uh, Dan Kiley, the landscape architect, integrating landscape and, and buildings together, which Professor Lyons talks about in, in her um, study here at Drake. So I think modernism is making a comeback. I really do. People are tired of buildings. Yes? Very close. Letters, letters uh, in her office, notes, where you, you said that she wanted to relate um, back to their personal. Oh, yeah, there's definitely respect. I mean, for example, even, even here at Drake, um, there, was, there, was a, uh, there was one letter I came across that was really cute. Um, they were coming to Drake <laughs> and asking uh, President Harmon. It was going to be Lacey, Joe Lacey, who was this kind of business manager who was lent by Lou Kahn in 1945 for a few weeks to help get General Motors started and retired in 1965, 20 years later, from Eros Aaron and Associates. He never left. Um, Lacey was coming. A lot of the correspondence between Harmon and, and uh, the office is through Joe Lacey. The father and the son were coming, and he was being asked to build a double room and a single. And it was for the father and son. and and uh, the partner. Um, a lot of the correspondence, when I first when I first began my interest in it, it was actually, I went up to Kevin Roach and uh, laid it on the table. I said, you know, I think, I think your, your mentor is, is a really important American architect and something needs to be done. And uh, he's, he let me sort of take over the office, which I did. I discovered two things. Um, one was there was a lot about Eros Arendon that we didn't know. I mean, there's more stuff about the past and his evolution as an architect. He did not emerge as Venus as, from the head of Zeus, you know, full grown. <laughs> he, he went through a lot of struggles, both uh, learning wise and, um, and emotionally and, and um, in his private life um, to build his career. And he was, after all, a foreigner. He arrived speaking no English. When he arrived in Evanston, I, I actually went to the Evanston School Board and found his registration in 1923. Um, he was listed as being 10 years old. He was 13 at the time, but he didn't know any English. Uh, so he went into fifth grade, which is why he bounced to eighth grade when they moved to Ann Arbor and he went to the University High School. And then he went to Birmingham, Baldwin High School in Birmingham, Michigan, and wound up graduating a semester early. They used to have these split June, uh, January, June graduation classes. He graduated earlier than he should have. Um, but I, I, I learned that uh, there were big pieces missing. 
and a lot of that was the correspondence. There are pieces of correspondence. There are some letters written. He was known as Puyo. Puyo was the nickname in the, in the family, uh, and Puyo means little boy. So when he was 45, he was still Puyo. <laughs> and it was a European kind of situation. I mean, his father, son, in a European family, that was really an oligarchy in many ways. Uh, they lived a good life, considering what they were living under. I mean, they had to give everything up to come to America. There was no practice. I mean, Elio Saarinen was designing Finnish mark notes. That was his commission, was designing the new Finnish mark note, which was a devalued currency. And when he got the, uh, the second prize, it was a lot of money in those days. He wound up in the Drake Hotel and then in Evanston and brought the family over, and the family stayed. They went back and forth to Finland on a regular basis. They never gave Vitresk up until, I think, uh, about 1948 or 49, maybe after the father died, maybe 52, somewhere like that. But Arrow kept his thumb on the, the owner. Um, it's now a national monument. You can go visit it. Very, very much worth a visit if you ever get to Helsinki. You can take a bus directly out from the bus station. That was a very close personal relationship. <coughs> but I think we've, you know, we've seen recently in American politics a father-son um, relationship. Um, I would say that the Sirens was a more successful version of that. <laughs> yes. Brooksburg? Um, generally not. I mean, they, did, they, they were kind of a studio. Um, and so when work came their way, the, I mean, ridiculous for General Motors to come to the Sarin in office. Um, but they were, very, they were very smart in getting Smith Hinchman Grills involved, involved with them. And um, I'm just trying to think. I think there were some other local firms in some of the work, um, such as Milwaukee, the War Memorial building, which is now has the Calatrava addition to it. Um, but it was very limited. Brooks Borg, I think, was the most extensive of their associated architects, because they really didn't have an office at the time. They really couldn't do the documentation that was necessary. Um, but by the time that the dormitories came along um, and the firm had been reconfigured as ESNA, um, they took on the drawings. Most of the drawings for the dorms are, are in fact, done by ESNA. Thank you so much. Um, There's more to come. <laughs>